Today you got me again. <laughs> Stuck three weeks in a row. Just to, for some of you who have, have not been here for three weeks, I'm going to just give a small capsule of what we're doing. This is the end of a three-week uh, overview of Christianity. Everything you need to know was in the last three weeks. It was. Everything you need to know. You don't have to go through all those classes and everything. Three 10-minute sessions and you're all done. <laughs> really. You begin with, if we, did this, if we did this the old way, we'd begin with uh, this. And we'd start with who? The Father, God the Father, and then God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. You got it. All done. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we look back and recapping, I'm doing this from a Franciscan standpoint. You know the stories from Scripture. You know them well. You know about Adam and Eve in the garden, and you know about Noah, and you know all of that stuff, and you've heard it again and again, and you keep coming back to listen to the story again, hopefully with a little different twist each time. But from a Franciscan standpoint, they didn't see sin and salvation the same way. From the beginning... Uh, at least the church has taught, you know, everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden, you know, and then and Eve gave Adam the apple. You know, it wasn't the other way around, you know, it was Eve gave Adam the apple. And then there was this, this sin, and then suddenly God the Father was really angry at everybody, and so he drove them out of the garden, and then Jesus had to come years later to save the world. Well, that's not a Franciscan view. Franciscan view is that God created everything good and interconnected, but incomplete. And we kind of know that from the galaxies around here. We, we thought for a long time the world was the center of everything, the universe, and now we know that there's multiple universes all over the place and multiple galaxies, and everything's expanding much at a greater rate than we ever thought. So the Franciscan way is kind of coming back, and, and, and people around here kind of say, we need to connect with nature, etc. That's all Franciscan. Because everything is connected, but it's moving. And we try to put this in terms of a story that when God created the world, he created actually a big stream. And people were placed in the stream, and they're, they're floating down this stream, and everything is fine because God's supporting them with the water. And then, boom, they hit their head on a rock, and they say, oh, that's so good. And then they keep going down the stream a little bit further, and they get hit with a branch, and then there's a little spider falls on them, and then they say, I don't think I like this stream. God says, stay in the stream. I don't like it. So what do they do? Go and they climb out of the stream. And they go up out the side of the river, and they go into the woods. And of course, in the woods, they think they're going <laughs> to get to where they want to go, but they run into all kinds of stuff. They stumble, they fall, they get poison ivy, they get all kinds of stuff. And as we discussed last week, they run into a whole herd. I don't think you'd call it a herd of snakes. What is it, a nest? It's a nest of snakes. And they get, okay, and they get bit. Um, and, and they don't do very well. And God also puts the uh, Ten Commandments in there to show them the way back to the stream. And what do they do with the Ten Commandments? Like you do with the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Ten Commandment week, you know. <laughs> Don't listen to it. So they go their own way again. The ego gets involved and says, I'm going to do it my way, my way, my way. And so God looks from down above and he says, you know, I really feel for these people. I really love them. We've got to do something for this. So what he does is God sends Jesus down there. And Jesus comes and shows the way of how to live to get back to the stream. And people kind of get it. They kind of get into it. And they even get baptized, feeling the water of baptism. You felt that last week? You, you did. The water of baptism splashing. And they get to the side of the bank of the river, and what happens? They get into their ankles, and they stop. And why should they go any further? They've gone as far as they want. In order for them to go further, they would have to listen to today's gospel reading. And when the seed falls and dies, it bears much fruit. But if it doesn't fall, it stays alone. So they're in the point of facing death. 
and needing to give up what? Remember these? You don't know what these are. These are shards. This table. We did this a couple of weeks ago. These are you. This is what everybody was carrying around. The one side, everything looks nice and shiny. And that's the way we present ourselves to everybody. Nice and shiny. If we really are honest to look in the mirror, it's not such a good, good surface, is it? And the problem with living that way is it has sharp edges. Our lives have sharp edges. We're being hit with all kinds of stuff. We're being hit with death. We're being hit with taxes. We're being hit with uncertainty politically. And we get sharp. We get sharp with ourselves, and we get sharp with other people. And we don't want to give that up. That's part of our memory. We brought that with us, and we've needed Jesus to take some of that sharpness off. those we discussed last week, and this is the way we've kind of used Jesus, takes the edges, takes the sharpness off, kind of coats us in a way. And that's what Christianity has done for probably the past 800 years, maybe a little less than that, is that Jesus was seen as somebody who takes the kind of the hurt off of your life, but then it stops. Done but there's another story. Last week as we came forward, we brought these pieces forward, each one with their story, and even if you didn't bring a piece forward, somebody put one in for you last week. And what came out of this was this. Can you see that? That's a table. Can you, you can come on around and see it. It's okay. You can stand up. It's all right. Go ahead. I can't turn it around, but you can go take a look. <laughs> Fine. Good. People with guts. I love it. Okay, good. But that's what you put together. Those are the pieces everybody brought forward. And we put it together. Cool. And what happened was that the pieces were surrounded by Jesus, but also the Holy Spirit needed to be there. And in doing that, coating it with the Holy Spirit, the pieces began to fit together. And so they would stick together. They were no, no longer separated. And that becomes what we call in the Greek ecclesia. It means community. It means assembly. To assemble something, to put the pieces together, Scripture would always say the assembly meets. This is an assembly piece. And this piece is assembly, assembled out of your work, out of your lives. It's not disappeared. It's still here but it's in a different form. Why do we need assembly or the church? Why do we need it? Why don't we just say, you know, I'm spiritual, but I don't have to be religious. Let me just go out to the woods. Let me just go to the field and just feel good. Why do we need a church? Why do we need it? You've got Jesus. Is there another story there? Yeah, there is. Because love needs to be organized. The church is about organizing love. Think about that for a second. The church is about organizing love. See the food baskets down here? Organization of love. What's the mission of St. Philip's? St. Philip's feeds. That's an organization of love. We use the church to organize love. It's not about being individual, but it's about working together and staying together and being 
glued together. And not only is the church glued together, but it's a place to receive Jesus who comes again and again and again. Christ keeps coming, keeps coming to all of us. And he does that in a very, very special, special way. And you know what way that is. You can answer that. Christ doesn't just come to us landing out in the middle of the woods somewhere. Christ comes to community, to the ecclesia, to the assembly, and says to us, this is my body which is given for you. This is my body. I'm coming to you. This is my blood shed for you, poured out for you, for the complete remission of sins. God comes to us. We don't see the top often, especially here. They always build altars high so you can't see the top. We do a lot of work up there. But actually, the top of the altar is like this. It's composed of people who've given themselves up to God. And God, like in a plane, needs a landing place for his loaf of bread. And he lands on the community. No other place but in the community. And comes again and again and again. It's how we organize love here. And he'll continue to do that. And he'll continue to love you and continue to love me. And when I get way off on a, on a path I shouldn't be on, somebody here comes and knocks me on the shoulder and says, can I help? I feel lonely. Can I rest my my head on your shoulder. I feel like weeping. Can, it, can you be there for me? I feel happy. Can you share with me? You don't do that alone. It takes more than one. Jesus knew that. And that's why the Holy Spirit came. You see that in today's story. It's like the beginning. You can see the beginning of the Holy Spirit working. The Greeks were coming seeking Jesus, right? And then they go to Philip. And what does Philip do? He runs over and he gets Andrew and pulls him along to go to Jesus starting to pull people together, not as individuals, but as a group. So Christ comes to us today again in the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the wine. He comes to you and me. We're going to be keeping this uh, table that you, you have created. You are the participants Many times we think that this is a show, quote-unquote show up here where the priest is doing everything. No, that's not how Jesus ever meant it or how the New Testament ever brought it. It was the work of the people, all of you coming together, that made this happen, that God recognizes. It's you who are important to God. Don't ever forget that. God loves you, and if you forget about it, taste him. Drink. He's here, present, to touch your life, to affect everything in your life, to turn everything upside down, and to fill it with love, love, and more love. We end in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.